guys, Alex Sutherland here, and I am super excited to bring you my new video on the theory and practice of early and mid-stage tournament play. I've been getting a ton of messages over the last month, emails, you know, asking when's the new MTT video coming out, and I know it's taken me a while, but that's because I put a ton of work into this. I have a whole bunch of simulation data, hand history, you know, aggregation analysis, theory, a whole bunch of really cool st new stuff that I don't think anyone else has really looked at rigorously before. So, let's get into it. Uh, at a high level, we're going to have three different sections in this video. We're going to be looking at general tournament theory and focused on the early stages. So when I say early stages, I'm going to be specifically referring to approximately the first two hours in a Poker Stars normal tournament structure. Um, you can certainly apply some of the theory and concepts to other structures to, you know, the third hour or something. But generally, we're going to be talking about points that are before you're really near the bubble, near the money and you're trying to build up your stack and go into those those later stages with in a strong position. So the first thing we're gonna talk about in terms of tournament theory is understanding uh, what ICM is, what skill edge is, how they are distinct and completely separable, and how they both combine to affect chip valuations and how much we should wanna take risks. And um, of course, the idea of ICM is totally determined by the payoff structure of the tournament. We're going to be talking about early and mid stages. So the effect of that is going to be minimal and the dominating effect is going to be skill edge for us. But all the, those two factors together are what really give us a chip valuation model that has chips not equal to dollar, dollars. And that is what makes tournaments so interesting to study and so special. Next, we're going to look at the theory effects of playing with antis and no rake. This is, of course, a pretty significant difference from cash games. Playing with antis means that there is a uh, significantly bigger incentive to steal the blinds, a bigger incentive to uh, defend the blinds. It can affect the proper preflop bet sizing. And then playing with no rake means that being a little more passive, you know, flatting a little more, calling a little more preflop is more attractive relative to raising because when you're playing cash games, you have this no flop, no drop policy that incentivizes aggression preflop to try and end the hand before rake is paid. Then finally, at a high level theory perspective, we'll be talking about how we adjust to various stack depths. I think this is a difficult thing to do, understanding how your strategy changes with a variety of different stacks and is one of the things that separates the elite tournament players from the good tournament players. Uh, there's a lot of players who will play, you know, certain stack sizes as well, but others incorrectly. And to really, you know, hit the maximum ROI for MTTs, you need to know how to play all the stacks uh, across the span of a tournament. And we'll look at how, theoretically, our decision making should vary based on our stack depth. Next, we'll get a little more concrete and we will look at preflop play. I have worked with SPF, uh, the simple postflop guys, and an MTT specialist friend of mine to design a preflop solution pack that has pre-computed simple post-flop solutions to uh, cut off and button opens where everyone folds till the big blind. And we will look at the correct three bet sizing, three bet strategies, reaction to three bets. We'll talk a bit about how we use marginal range building to construct good opening ranges. Um, and we will get into a little bit of the theory behind all this the current kind of population strategies for preflop play and MTTs have some pretty significant leaks, both in sizing and in range construction. And so we will look a bit at how these differ because simple postflop ran all these uh, cloud-based calculations for us for free. Uh, the pack is available for sale separately through them. Um, GTORB users will get a discount. I will go through the high level details of the ranges and some of the theoretical implications of them. But if you want to see all the exact ranges, you will need to buy that from simple post flop. Then I'm going to use some new aggregation uh, techniques that simple post flop has added to their software to compute some aggregate GTO post flop frequencies that will match our HUD data so that we can assess our opponents better on the fly in tournaments because one of the tricky things about MTTs is even if you're a reg, you don't end up at the table with other regs as frequently. Uh, and so you have to make kind of quicker reads based on your HUD data, based on your observations about how people are playing. 
And a good precursor to doing that effectively is to have a good understanding of what GTO seabedding frequencies are, what GTO seabed defense frequencies are, stuff like that, so that you can quickly analyze this guy defends too much, this guy defends too little, etc. Then we will talk a bit about how you need to adjust your preflop play to make exploitive adjustments based on the table conditions. And this brings up the issue of that GTO play has some flaws in three-handed situations. And so uh, for these preflop solutions we looked at, for example, with big blind versus button, where button open, small blind folded, uh, those solutions all assume you kind of have a reasonably standard small blind who three bets a kind of normal frequency defends kind of normal frequency. If you have a really fishy small blind, uh, you're going to need to adjust your play. You're going to need to understand how to adapt to having uh, very fishy players in, in specific spots. And if you actually just keep playing GTO blindly in a, say, button versus small blind and big blind, where the small blind is crazy, we'll see that the big blind can actually exploit you uh, by kind of using the small blind against you and profit. Then finally, our third section will be on post-flop play. And we will look at, you know, how to adjust your post-flop strategy across a wide range of SPRs. I think a lot of MTT players, particularly those with a cash background, kind of have a really good understanding of 100 BB play, and maybe they've studied like 20 BB play, but they haven't really looked carefully at how your post-flop strategy generally shifts as you go from 100 BBs to 50 BBs to 40 BBs, you know, down to, tw down to 20, and even how to correctly play a stack with 10 BBs, for example. So we will look a little bit at trying to understand at a high level how things like c-betting, how things like c-bet defense uh, shift as you take you know the same same hand shifted ranges and just decrease the stack size. Then finally, we will talk a little bit about how the ICM and skill edge and risk aversion all relate to post-flop play as well as pre-flop play and how to adjust your post-flop play to incorporate these effects. So that is our overview. It's a lot of material. Um, let's just get into it.